In this video, we're going to explore something really cool, the improved S function. Now, in my last video, I talked about the S function using a simple definition, but it didn't quite capture the exponential behavior I was looking for. So I've made some changes, and now the S function is defined in a way that makes it grow in a more interesting, exponential-like way. Let's dive in and see what this improved version can do. Okay, let's start with the definition. The improved S function, which we'll call S to the power of X, is defined by an infinite series. Here's how it works. We take the sum from N equals zero to infinity of X to the power of N divided by N double factorial. Now what's a double factorial? It's like a regular factorial, but instead of multiplying all the numbers, you multiply every other number. For example, five double factorial is five times three times one, which is 15. So, if we write out the first few terms of this series, we get 1 plus x plus x squared divided by 2 plus x cubed divided by 3 plus x to the 4th divided by 8 plus x to the 5th divided by 15, and so on. This series converges for all real numbers x, and the function grows slower than e to the power of x, but faster than 2 to the power of x. This makes it a really interesting function to study. Let's compute the value of s to the power of 1 using this series. If we plug in x equals 1, we get 1 plus 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 8 plus 1 over 15, and so on. If we add these up, we get approximately 3.059. Now, let's compare this to e to the power of 1, which is about 2.718, and 2 to the power of 1, which is just 2. You can see that s to the power of x grows faster than 2 to the power of x, but slower than e to the power of x. This intermediate growth rate is one of the key features of the improved s function. Now let's see how the improved s function relates to the standard exponential function, e to the power of x. We can express e to the power of x in terms of s to the power of x like this. e to the power of x equals s to the power of x times the logarithm of e with base s. Now, to find the derivative of e to the power of x, we use the chain rule. The derivative is the logarithm of e with base s times s to the power of x times the logarithm of e with base s, which simplifies to the logarithm of e with base s times e to the power of x. This shows that the derivative of e to the power of x is proportional to e to the power of x, with the proportionality constant being the logarithm of e with base s. Numerically, this constant is about 0.894. So the improved s function introduces a scaling factor, but still captures the exponential behavior of e to the power of x. Next, let's define the s trigonometric functions using the improved s function. First, we have s cosine of x, which is defined as the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the power of k times x to the power of 2k divided by 2k double factorial. Similarly, s mass sine of x is defined as the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the power of k times x to the power of 2k plus 1 divided by 2k plus 1 double factorial. If we write out the first few terms of s cosine of x, we get 1 minus x squared over 2 plus x to the 4th over 8 minus x to the 6th over 48 and so on. For s sine of x, we get x minus x cubed over 3 plus x to the 5th over 15 minus x to the 7th over 105 and so on. These functions are related to s to the power of x through the identity. s to the power of i times x equals s cosine of x plus i times s sine of x. This is similar to Euler's formula but uses the improved s function instead of e to the power of x. Now let's compute the derivatives of s cosine of x and s sine of x using two methods, summation notation and term-by-term -term differentiation. First, using summation notation, the derivative of s cosine of x is negative s sine of x. Similarly, the derivative of s sine of x is s cosine of x. Now let's do term-by-term -term differentiation. For s cosine of x, we get negative x plus x cubed over 2 minus x to the fifth over 8, and so on. For s sine of x, we get 1 minus x squared plus x to the 4th over 3, and so on. At first glance, these results might seem inconsistent, but if we compute the numerical values, they match. For example, at x equals 1, s, s cosine of 1 is about 0.648, and s sine of 1 is about 0.841. The derivatives are, the derivative of s cosine of x at x equals 1 is about negative 0.841, and the derivative of s sine of x at x equals 1 is about 0 
This confirms that both methods give the same results numerically. Now let's define the s hyperbolic functions. First we have s cosh of x, which is defined as s to the power of x plus s to the power of negative x, all divided by 2. Similarly, s sin inch of x is defined as s to the power of x minus s to the power of negative x, all divided by 2. These functions satisfy properties similar to the standard hyperbolic functions. For example, the derivative of s cosh of x is s sinh of x, and the derivative of s sinh of x is s cosh of x. They also satisfy the identity s cosh squared of x minus s sin squared of x equals 1. These functions give us another way to explore the behavior of the improved s function. The improved s function is now defined using double factorials, which gives it exponential like growth. It grows slower than e to the power of x, but faster than 2 to the power of x, and it's related to exponential, trigonometric and hyperbolic functions. The derivatives of s cosine of x and s sine of x are consistent across different methods, and they show some really interesting patterns. This improved version is more mathematically robust and opens up new possibilities for exploration. If you're curious, I encourage you to play around with it and see what you can discover. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more math content. Let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next. Maybe we can explore the asymptotic behavior of the S function or its connections to special functions. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.